thank you so much. I really, really appreciate Joan and Matt being here. And they, they can answer additional questions. We'll be talking about contractors' issues also um, later on. But I first want to introduce Martha Erisman. She is from the California Health Advocates, and she has some very interesting information on fraud for you. I have a very strong voice, so you tell me if I don't need to stand close to the microphone. Good afternoon. My name is Marta Erisman, and um, as you can hear, I do have an accent. And uh, if by any chance you don't understand what I'm saying, please feel free to make me repeat it, and sometimes I have to spell it. I don't mind. I'm used to it. But what I do, I work for California Health Advocates, which is an organization that does advocacy at the national level for Medicare. We we try to interpret, protect the beneficiaries of Medicare. And if you ever want to know anything about Medicare, you just have to go to our website. We uh, have a, a series of documents that will explain Medicare policy and regulations in a language that I and you can understand. So. Uh, Please feel free to use our website, and our telephones are there, and you can contact any time. I work for the department that does education and fraud prevention against Medicare fraud. Um, and right now, it's very difficult to pinpoint exactly how much money is stolen out of you and I, because it's our money that they are stealing, nobody else's. But at this time, the <coughs> estimates are that one out of $10 is stolen out of Medicare. And as I was coming over, people mentioned to me, a person here in the audience mentioned, all these people, you know, they really know how to play the system. I have news for you. It is not the beneficiaries. It is not the people that are stealing from Medicare. The majority is stolen by providers. And who do I mean by providers? Uh, the providers of medical equipment. I have seen psychiatrists. I have seen um, home health aides, ambulances, you name it, um, laboratories, you name it. They have figured out an angle on how to get money out of uh, Medicare. And this year, we have been very much aware of large scale fraud. But I, I have, I'm here to tell you that uh, sometimes people don't call, oh, it's just a little thing. You don't know if Medicare is creating a file and when 10 complaints come in, they say, aha, there is a trend and we need to investigate a trend. A case in point is um, diabetic shoes. Uh, these people go out to health fairs, senior health fairs, and are offering diabetic shoes, and uh, uh, the first thing they ask you, are you on Medicare? Oh, you don't have to worry about paying for them because Medicare will pay for them. Um, my husband, who goes, who goes to the health fairs with me, is very well trained to go around and spot people that have booths that are of a doubtful nature. But uh, he went and poised there as a diabetic that needed shoes. Not only did they offer him these shoes, is that they offered him to train him to have his own shoe franchise. Uh, um, 
I, you know, all, I, I, I don't investigate. I am not trained to investigate. And as much as I'm tempted to do my own investigation, I don't do it because I may messed it up. You know, so I'm very, very careful uh, to leave the role of investigations to uh, people that are trained. I am not trained to do that. But uh, anyway, so when we reported this gentleman, apparently there had been over 100 complaints. Um, they were hot after them. And, and because it crossed several states, uh, the FBI had been involved in it. Is in a sense, I call it, when I report a case, I call it, oh my God, it's going to go into the black hole. Because when they are investigating, they don't, they are not going to give you the details, oh, here we are in our investigation. So a lot of people get frustrated that they make the phone call, they report, and then, you know, it's three months, and you haven't heard uh, about them. Um, I had a, 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 I reported a case in 2008, and it's just going to come into trial. So it does take time. But what I want to share with you, what's going on right now, what I'm, uh, the reports that I have made, and I report to Medicare first, and Medicare will then decide whether, uh, well, a Medicare reports to the Office of Investigator General, and they decide whether they are going to call the FBI in or not. Uh, one of my cases, and, um, and a, a lot of the times, I find that senior say, well, it's only $145. Maybe they made a mistake. I want you to call and report it and let the expert decide if it's a mistake. I had this um, elderly woman that got up in the morning. She was 91. She got up in the morning and she was very dizzy. So she w decided that she would go to the local clinic you know, those uh, clinics in the neighborhood. And uh, she got to the clinic, they sat her on a chair, and when she came up and said that she was very, very dizzy, they immediately called an, uh, an ambulance and sent her to an emergency room. Well, you know, that, that would be the end of that, but uh, the phone call came because she had gotten, three months later, she had gotten the summary notice uh, from, uh, from Medicare, and it said there that they had paid the emergency room charges, but she owed the clinic the $145 co-payment for the save services provided at the clinic. So she had called me because she said, this is unfair, all I did sit on the chair, and I don't think that I should pay $145 for a phone call. And uh, we reported them, uh, this just happened recently. She jumped the gun and went home and called the clinic and said, I reported you to the police, to Medicare, and the Office of the Investigator General, and they are gonna investigate you. <laughs> you know, so I am not paying the $145. Well, lo and behold, the administrator of the clinic called uh, Medicare and said there had been a mistake and they wanted to uh, reimburse the ch charges to Medicare. You have to realize that California has five million people, five million plus in Medicare. If these little mistakes happen, you know, what, how much money will that be? So however little, please report it. The next case that I have that she called me, this is uh, the wife of a, a senior, and she called I, that she had gotten a delivery of a hospital bed. And that upon receiving the, the, the bed, 
her husband was a very tall man, and this belt was very short, so his feet were hanging on the end of the rail of the bed. Plus, there was dry blood in the frame of the bed. And she called because she was desperate. She had been calling the, uh, the durable medical equipment, and nobody has come to the phone. They kept giving her the run around, and here it is, four, four months later. And the bed is still there, and Medicare is paying for uh, the rental of this bed that's not suitable, and furthermore, is dirty. Uh, so there are no huge cases. I don't know how many of these either wheelchairs or beds are in the same situation, but it may be that this is the one that opens up the door for an investigation for someone, for an organization that is not, is not doing good business and is defrauding the Medicare beneficiaries. Um, so I'm here to tell you that we are counting on you. We are counting on the alertness of seniors. And because it's, it is our money, you know they are planning to cut and to reform and to do all that. And the reason is because of the fraud. A lot of it is fraud. So we have to take care of it. And I uh, can tell you that I swear that these people do market research. They must do ma market research because they do target populations. They do target population. One, one of the cases that I had was in Watsonville, and they went to a, a Mexican American Senior Center. And there was a van outside the center. They are not allowed to be on the property, but there was a van there. And uh, when they were coming out, they offered the seniors um, you know, a trip to the Indian casino. And if they would come to their clinic, and a bag of groceries. And you know, when you are on SSI, that's very limited. If somebody is gonna give you a bag of groceries and a trip to the Indian casino, I tell you, you cannot go, you cannot go to an Indian casino on SSI. So they did recruit a whole group of seniors. And um, how we found out? In one of my brochures over there is the Senior Medicare Patrol um, phone number. And I had been there the, the week before. And um, by chance, he had it in his pocket. They transported them from Watsonville to San Jose. And um, this gentleman said, hmm, this is an industrial area. Medical clinics are not in industrial areas. And they, when he got off this little minibus, uh, they asked him for his Medicare, Medicare and medical card. And he said, no, I'm not going to give it to you. And he said, I'm gonna, he said we're not giving you a ride back to Watsonville. And that's why he called. He wanted me to give him a ride back to Watsonville. And I said, I live in Sacramento. And then I said, can I call your son, your daughter, your, anyone? Please don't tell my son. He's going to make fun of me. And uh, we ended up calling the police in San Jose. And, um, and they did call the FBI. And because they had had, you know, they have known of this group that has been moving up from Los Angeles up. And when the they would go and catch, try to catch them. They had already left. But this time, they were able to catch them uh, the next day. They uh, allowed the, the little band to come back. And uh, they were able to catch them. So uh, this is just one, one instance. But there are many, many, many instances that uh, they use to um, try to make you part with your Medicare card number, which you know is your social security number, right? 
Um, the other fraud that's happening right now is that they are calling seniors between five and six o'clock in the morning to tell them that um, because of Obamacare, they are issuing new Medicare cards and they are calling to verify if this is their number so, because they don't want to send them the wrong number. And so they read a wrong number and they say, is that your number? And you know, when you are, I guess you are half asleep, uh, they correct and give the, the same number. And they said, well, um, do you have part B? And yeah, I have part B. Well, it will be, you get a discount if we can take the payment out of your checking account. So they take the money out of the checking account. And you know, by the way, they not only take the money, the $94 or $96, they clean them out. So please, please, your Medicare card is your credit card for medical care. You would not give your Visa or MasterCard to anyone, right? Mm -hmm. Well, don't give your Medicare card number to anyone unless, you know, it's your doctor, your hospital, but uh, please don't. I, I, I am surprised sometimes that people are calling me about fraud. Mm -hmm. This is so and so. This is, you know, Peter Gonzalez. My social security number is. Do not leave a social security number or a Medicare card number on a recording machine. You don't know who's out there. You don't know who's, uh, you know, taking down notes of those numbers. So um, my table is over there. It's the one with the chocolates. <laughs> and I have, a, um, you know, information, literature, and I'm available. Um, I know many of you have um, belong to organizations. I, I do speak like I'm talking to you, and I don't think I'm too boring. So if you belong to an organization and would like me to go and speak, you know, at either a launch or a church group, I really would really appreciate it if you invite me to speak because it's word of mouth that is stopping the fraud. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. I have a spoken at the Rotary Club, the L Club, Senior Companions. Um, I have a spoken at PTAs because many adults, adult children are taking care of their par you know, parents. So I will speak to anyone that invites me uh, to speak. Um, I have a spoken at women's groups. I actually spoke at a, a, an invest an investment club. So, um, you know, so I just pass the word around because uh, right now I think that the adult children are very much involved in the care of their parents and grandparents. So I would tell somebody that you need help. No, I, I, I have the information in the back table and I'll give you my card, I have a card there. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes.
And typically what happens is when they get hold of a number, they are up for sale in the internet. And um, so anyone that wants to commit fraud, once you give them the number, uh, another crook can, you know, another fraudster can get it and buy it from uh, this person. But the number gets used and used and used, then the uh, file of the person that has the number stolen is labeled abuser. So <laughs> if you go and um, want to get um, um, a, a medical service and your file is labeled abuser, well, there is a delay because they, uh, they have to check whether this is, uh, you know, Medicare is going to approve the medical care for that particular person. And I had, a couple of years ago, I had a lady that came that uh, she had been denied a hysterectomy because she had a hysterectomy the year before. So, um, and as you well know, once they take everything out, there is nothing to get out. So, um, she, we, you know, eventually the surgery happened, but it, it took us a few months to unscramble all that had been charged to that uh, Medicare number. So it's not, it's not only money, it's, thank you for bringing that up, is what happens to your personal file. And um, the other case that I, I just got was a psychiatrist, and um, the daughter called in because she got all the summary notices that call because her father had passed away. And, when, and her father was in a nursing home. And the nursing home, you know, uh, gave her all, all the summary notices. What she noticed is, was that there was a psychiatric charges to, uh, to her father's number. There's a slight problem. Her father has, had been nonverbal for five years. So how could she have, how could he have gotten a speech, you know, talk therapy when he was unable to speak for, for five years. So anyway, so I could go on and on and on, and on um, because there is not a branch of uh, Medicare services that is not aff affected by fraud. So I just want you to keep your eyes peeled and you know pay attention and yes. Julie Tupper, my question is for the victim who's been caught in Medicare fraud, In the 145, it depends. You know, we don't know if they are going to find out that this clinic is doing it on a r routine basis, and uh, uh, and then there is more than 145 dollars. So law enforcement, when law enforcement gets involved with it, you're saying the FBI was getting involved with it. Is it up to the individual to recover or something like that to happen? Or Typically, it it's not. This lady didn't pay the, her copay. Uh, typically, it doesn't happen, and if you report that somebody, that there are charges in there, or that you, in, you know, inadvertently uh, got involved in this fraud, like people in, um, in Orange County that got, the, that got sent wheelchairs, and they kept them. Um, you know, it, when they found out that there was fraud involved, they wanted to return the, the wheelchairs. Well, our office in Orange County is not in the business of recovering, you know, wheelchairs. They were terrified that they were going to put in jail. T the, typically, uh, in cases like this, they are considered as victims, not as perpetrators. So, because, you know, you have been defrauded in, to a certain, Sometimes the victim does lose their, there's no recovery then. Well, typically there is no, nothing has been paid by the victim. Like in the case for the, um, medic, the diabetic shoes, um, they were billing uh, Medicare $375. And then typically you had to have a copay, but guess what? They were waiving the copay. The, depart the department. Yeah. So, Anyway, so the, the person that got these shoes 
I'm diabetic. And I went and tried them, and boy, boy it was like uh, walking on clouds. <laughs> but um, um, I tell you, there are shoe stores that can sell them for $100, $120. So you don't need to buy diabetic shoes at those prices. So one thing that the, the Medicare is going to start um, is that uh, one of the complaints has been that the durable medical equipment companies they send an application with an address, and um, they check at random because there are over 500,000 medical um, equipment suppliers across the nation. So they check at, ran at random, and uh, they found that some of those uh, durable medical equipment were in gas stations, uh, closed, you know, closed stores. So now uh, they are thinking of uh, starting um, um, a program where they are going to uh, contract, um, and I, it may be through us that we will have a group of uh, volunteers checking the local addresses of the durable medical equipment to see if there are not in empty garages and things like that. So anyway, thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Marta. I learn something new every single time. <laughs> the crits are just getting smarter, aren't they? Um, thank you so much for that. Drew Cheney is next from the Public Utilities Commission, and he has a lot more to tell you about fraud. Okay. All right, good afternoon. Now, I have a very important one question quiz for everyone. Okay? There is one answer, but if you get it wrong, it's okay. Most people always get this wrong. Who are the worst scammers? Come on. Don't, I, you can't say grandchildren. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't accept that. Someone said that last time. No. No, no. No. Worst scammers. You ready? You. And I see people, oh, 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 oh. no, it's true. Now think about it, because if you are not doing everything you can to educate yourself, to protect yourself, and to protect those around you, you're scamming yourself. That's the easiest way to look at it. So I always tell people, you are the biggest scammers if you're not doing everything you can to protect yourself. Okay, so quiz is over. So that, so that is the foundation. Once again, Drew Cheney. I'm the Northern California Outreach Officer for the California Public Utilities Commission. And so is anyone here not familiar with the PUC? Well, one of those agencies, either you, you really know us or you don't know us at all. In short, what we do is we regulate a lot of the utilities in California. We started off as the Railroad Commission back in the 1800s. So now we regulate rail safety, we regulate electrical and natural gas utilities, some water utilities, some telecommunications providers here in California, as well as for hire passenger carriers, and uh, so as charter buses, limousines, and also moving companies. That could even include hot air balloons. So we, we have a, a wide range of things. So I have a lot of stuff I'm going to go over. But for the most part, though, I want to kind of come up with some, some simple rules of thumb, tips and tricks, things to think about that really does apply to everything we've heard about before. Because if you notice, there's kind of a, a tangled web being assembled up here. Uh, the senator spoke. And then we had folks on the Contractor State License Board. They spoke. And then um, we had California Health Advocates speak. And you see that even though we're all kind of doing different things, kind of what we're pointing at and what we're, we're tending to motion people to do kind of port, goes towards a central unified purpose. And the, to me, basically, I, I kind of have these simple tenets that I always say is that um, silence is not your friend. And I don't know if you've heard it from other folks that have just talked here, is that you know, you always hear about making complaints and talking to others. If you are quiet, if you are silent, whether it be discussing something, asking questions, or making complaints, you're not doing yourself any good, and you're not doing anyone else any good. You're going to be costing people money, the state money, yourselves money. Uh, you're, don't be silent. 
What is your friend is communication. Communication with other state agencies, communication with local law enforcement, communication with local governments, cities, counties, even federal agencies, with your legislators. The thing is, if we are not all on the same page when it comes to scamming, n no one gets helped. And here's a little factoid that I like to point out to folks. Uh, the number one target for scammers, unfortunately, seniors. Do you know who the, the, the second most scammed demographic is? Disabled. It's gonna, no, it's gonna break your heart. Children. Keep going, keep going. Military. Military. And the thing is, people don't realize, that doesn't just mean someone who's over the age of 65. We're talking veterans who are 18 years old. So military personnel of all ages, because think about it, you have these young men and women, and older men and women, they're used to following orders and, they, and they, they've got other things in their mind, they're gonna be shipped off in six months. Someone comes up to them and says, hey, just in case you don't come back, I'll take care of your family if you sign this form. You know, okay, so that's the thing to think about is these, they prey on people. Scammers like to prey on people. They try and find people to, to, that they can target and then they can work through and with. And so another thing that you'll notice, and I'll, I'll take questions at the end, um, another thing that you'll notice that some of the things that's kind of a common theme, you'll see what we're working with too, is also what was mentioned before, you'll see affinity marketing. They say, okay, you know what? Hey, you're in a church group. And so someone will come in and they'll be of the same religion and really kind of work things. Or you'll be in a bridge club and, and you'll have some, and you'll always find people, they find ways in. So once again, communication. Make sure people are communicating with each other. Make sure you're working together as a team. Just because you're running information by someone, if, you, if, if someone comes up to you, you're gonna get um, a roof estimate done. Just because you're asking a family member or a friend or someone to look over a contract to say, hey, you know, does this look right to you? You're not giving up independence. You're not giving up freedom. You're not, you're not saying that you're not intelligent. It's just that you're so involved with what's going on there, you might not be able to see the forest from the trees. You might be so excited about it, you're not taking a step back to go, wait, am I really thinking about everything? And someone might, you know, your neighbor could look at this and go, oh, you totally forgot X, Y, Z. And you'll go, oh, because you were so excited about it. Doesn't, does it necessarily, necessarily mean you're doing anything wrong? You just might not think about it. I know people who are 35 years old that have been scammed that who are, you know, they're perfectly intelligent, fine people, but just they, they don't think about it. So once again, communicate, communicate, communicate. Okay. Um, and I want to go back, I'm trying to think of, ah, yes. So when, when we heard the story about the group that would park outside a senior center and say, you know what, here, if you come with us, you know, we'll give you lunch, we'll give you groceries, we'll take you somewhere, all you do is give us your card. Now, if they were transporting someone somewhere also, that's under our purview too. That, all of a sudden, they became a four higher passenger carrier. So this, this is one of those things again, once again, there's these little connections between different things that these folks, they're not just breaking one law sometimes, sometimes they're breaking multiple laws. And so, once again, silence is not your friend because if you're quiet about something and someone says, oh, it's no big deal, or, or my, my favorite is people say, well, I took care of it, it's done. You know, I called them, they gave me my money back, it's done. So maybe you took care of it, but it was mentioned before, they might be scamming or have already scammed 50 other people and they might have taken a lot more money from them or caused a lot more pain and suffering. If we, the regulators and law enforcement agencies, don't know what's going on, if we don't have kind of a, a spotlight on some of these bad operators, we can't help other people. And so it really pays that, you know, if someone had brought something like that up, maybe that group was part of a ring that they operate these charter buses and they're operating them illegally and they might not be safe, they might not be licensed. So it's those things, report anything and everything, and even if it's just a penny, even if it's just a single cent, it's the principal. We're paid to, to do this. You're not putting us out of our way if you contact us. That's why our, our phone numbers are on here. Silence is not your friend. I will say that again. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start off with some of my brochures. Like I said, we have a, a, a wide variety of documents and information back there, so I'm gonna kinda go through this quickly because some of it's kind of spread out there. I will start with my favorite brochure that we have. And finally, um, what we were able to do is put this brochure together, a nice simple little trifold. It has all of the public purpose programs available. 
So we, as a regulatory agency, we ask the utilities and other uh, and bodies to, ad we administer public purpose programs and we say these are, these are programs that are designed to help folks for repairs. And this is something to think about too. These programs, this is not a handout. If you have ever had a place where you live where you were able to turn on the electricity or heat water or use the telephone, you have been paying into these programs. It's like social security. You've been paying into them. So they're available for you. Some of these are age and income qualified, some are not. Uh, I'd like to point out anyone who's ever heard of California Lifeline, telecommunications program. Okay, it's, it's quite popular. Um, actually, the, the, as you can see, the saturation right here in California of the, of the people who are eligible, I think it's over 90% of the people who can use it or are using it. That's wonderful. It's a great program. It helps people stay in communication with others. My favorite program that we do here in California, Deaf and Disabled Telecommunications Program, DDTP. Hey, I heard it say a hand in front. It's, it's great. What I love the fact, this is not income qualified. It is not, there's no age qualifications. All you need, if, if you have any type of disability, hearing, visual, cognitive, doesn't matter. If your doctor signs off on the form, you get the assistive technology at no cost. And gone are the days of just a, a phone with an extra loud ringer or some of them just, or you're just a phone with big buttons. There's amazing technology out there and the, and the DDTP people, they will come to different groups, organizations, and they'll have the, you know, examples of these phones laid out. And I've, I've been to multiple events where someone will come up, you know what? Having this phone saved my mother's life. And I've heard that multiple times. And so once again, no cost. I love this program. Um, anyone heard of CARE? California Alternative Rates for Energy? What that is, it gives you a 20% discount on your energy bills. And so, and so it's wonderful. And so definitely I'll come back, grab some information on that. And then FIRA, if you do not qualify under CARE, also FIRA, it's a federal program, similar, it's the same thing, it's income qualified, but the, the qualification limits are a little bit higher. So some people can apply for that as well. My second favorite program that a lot of people unfortunately do not know about is Medical Baseline. What medical baseline is, once again, no age requirements, no income requirements. Your doctor needs to sign a form saying that you require extra heating, extra cooling, or extra electricity for medical equipment. If you need that, they raise your baseline allowance so you can use more electricity at a lower rate. And it's, to me, it's heartbreaking how many people do not know, how many doctors don't even know about this, okay? So that, that is in this brochure, take a good look. If you need more, I've got plenty more in the back. Part of the programs, I like to bring this up here, even though, uh, and I must, uh, I need to make a little bit of disclosure here. Even though these are older brochures, I don't like wasting stuff. So the basic information is the same. Some of the numbers are different, like the income qualification numbers will be different. If you contact the utilities or the providers, the administrators of these programs, they will have the correct information. It's really simple calls to find it. But I just want to make sure you at least have the information in your hands. I like to hand this one out to the Lifeline brochure because in the center here, when it talks about two ways of, to qualify for these programs, most of the programs are some overlap. So either program-based or income-based. So income-based, obviously, if you meet certain income requirements, you apply. But also, I'm not gonna read the whole list because it's very long. If you are in any of these programs, automatically qualify. Medicaid, Medi-Cal, WIC. Healthy Families Category A, LIHEAP, SSI, SNAP, NSNL, TAMF, CalWORKS, GAIN. So there's, there's a whole list of things. So I like to pass this out too because a lot of folks think, oh, no, nah, it might not apply to me. You'd be very surprised. There's a lot of help out there. Okay. Now, getting into scams. Most of the scams that we deal with with our agency that we see as a regulatory agency, they're not as common as they used to be and sometimes it can get very tricky when it comes to things crossing state lines and whatnot, but I still really, I like to stress the fact that folks need to, the number one thing about these scams especially, I, I feel confident saying that if you educate yourself and you're diligent and watch yourself and work with someone else to, to make sure you're watching yourself, I think you pretty much will be able to steer clear of these scams. It, you, you get, you gotta be on top of it though. Okay, so there's two scams I'm going to show off right here when it comes to telephone scams. Star 72 and 809. 
And so, in essence, the, the basis with these programs when you're looking at this, these scams is someone calls you, leaves you a message and says, do this. And you listen, you go, okay, and you do it. So in one case, you either call this 809 phone number, it's got an 809 area code, and most people just kind of rush and they go, oh, okay, yeah, it's, eight, it's close to 800, you know, 809, yeah, whatever. It's a phone number <coughs> in the Caribbean, and it's a toll number, so instead of like a 900 number, you don't realize it, and it, and it racks up lots and lots and lots and lots of charges on your bill. Up sometimes, I've, I've seen, I've heard of cases up into the thousands. So be very careful that star 72, very similar what that is, as people don't realize, depending on your telephone carrier, star 72 can start what is called call forwarding. So what they'll do is they'll say, you'll, you'll, someone will get a message like frantically, oh, hello, this is officer so-and-so at the scene of the crash, your, your niece, uh, somehow and scammers will know you that they move your niece through some other way, like your niece was in a horrible accident and in order to get a hold of us to see what's going on, dial star 72, blah, 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 they'll give you a number. And you going, oh my God, what's wrong with my niece? You dial star 72 and the number. What that does then, if you, you have now established call forwarding, all the calls that come to your phone get forwarded to that number that you punched in after star 72. So if that's like an 809 number or something that costs 10 bucks a minute, all of a sudden, all these charges are going through and they're getting racked up on your bill. And also the scammers sometimes, they'll have a bunch of other people call that number, your number, because it gets through and it gets forwarded and it all gets on your bill, okay? So once again, when you get a number, and this is, I think all of us will say this, you know, police, contract specializing board, anyone who's ever, any information you see, if there's a number you don't recognize or it's a person you don't recognize, wait on it. Check, if it truly is an emergency, there's ways to make sure that, that it truly is legitimate. The latest one is this email that's being sent out by our friends. They get an email. We got an email from one of our members of our organization, and it said that uh, they were stuck in Europe. They lost their wallet. They, I couldn't believe it. I sent that on to the person who, who, who the email yep. came from, and I said, that's not true. Yeah, he's and he's like, I'm in Galt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm not in yeah. Europe. I'm in Galt. Yeah, and she was, she's the president of our organization, and she's yep. in uh, Vincent. I called her up. So, Do you know we got this? And uh, they said it's fraud. Yep. Yes, it happens a lot. And once again, even from people you know, and I was speaking with someone before this event even started, you can get you can get an email from a friend that says, oh, check this out, it's this link. But actually, it was about eight months ago, there was a whole slew of people, their email accounts were getting hacked. And so all of a sudden, these hackers are getting, they figure out the password and just send a bunch of emails to everyone in your address book with a link that would take them to some, you know, who knows what, it was bad. And so that's the thing is one, you, you've got to stay on top of it. You've got to watch it. Um, and something that I also, I wanna point out with these, including to that, is also two, two types of scamming that you don't see as much anymore, but they still do happen, slamming and cramming. Has anyone ever heard of that? Okay, slamming is what, the, what happens is when an outside party is able to change your long distance or local telephone carrier, normally it's your long distance, without your approval or knowledge. Cramming is where goods and or services are added to your bill without your approval or knowledge. And so, slamming doesn't happen so much anymore, but still can. Um, some kind of things to watch out for, you know, sometimes if you're walking in the mall or somewhere and you see someone with a little table set up and says, Win a trip to Tahiti or win a cruise to Hawaii. Just enter your information and put the, the thing in the box and we'll, whoever, we pull your name out, you're good to go. And you don't realize that on the back, in very, very, very small elf writing, I mean, it's so tiny, as by sign above, you've agreed to let Bob's Banana Boat Telecom be your carrier of choice. Da, 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 da. So in essence, what you're doing by signing all this, yes, you, you've put your information in for, for a drawing to go on a trip, but also, you're saying that Bob's Banana Boat Telecom that charges you $10 a minute to make phone calls is not your carrier of choice. Legally, it's fine. That's the problem. Because you signed it, there was a disclaimer there, you know? There you go. Be careful, read everything. If something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Okay, so that's one way how they, they'll, that, that aspect of they'll, they'll switch stuff on you. A uh, fun story is down in Texas, because their laws were kind of lax this way, um, 
you can make any name you wanted for a carrier. And so there was a very enterprising individual. He made tele telecommunications carriers. They were called, I don't know, I don't care, and whatever. And they could charge you $20 a minute. So when you moved in Texas, if you got a new house in your local carrier, the, you know, the, the uh, distribution network would say, OK, well, who would you like your, your long distance carrier to be? Oh, I don't know. OK, there you go. Now you're signed up with, I don't know, 20 bucks a minute. Have fun. So it's things like that. Just really be on top of it. Now slamming and cramming, the cramming part of it, when they add goods or services, that, that can get to be murkier areas. The same way as you might be in the mall, you sign something, all of a sudden they add a gym membership onto your phone bill or some tickets for a show or a concert or movies. Um, different things like that they'll add on. Also something to think about, how many of you own cell phones? Okay. How many of you make the mistake of giving them to someone under the age of 21 for more than 10 seconds? How about five-year-olds? That's just as bad sometimes if you don't lock it. Um, because what happens is some people don't realize, they'll see something that says, oh, sign up for this ringtone or you know, buy a ringtone. You're like, oh, okay. And the, and the kids will go, oh, that's fun. And we'll do it. They don't realize that now they've signed you up for a $5 or $20 a month service to get whatever access on your phone. Okay, watch it. One thing I always tell for, say for people for any of your, whether it be cell phone, local or long distance, make sure that either you or someone else you trust, you can call the telephone company and say, I want to make sure only this one to how many people, these are the only people that can make changes to my account. And you can do that. So if a third party comes up and says, well, they said I could make changes to the account, the phone company says, well, you know, are you Drew Cheney? No, but he said I could do it. Sorry, you're not on the list. They can't change your account. They can't do anything. Do it. It's so simple. Okay. When you leave here today, when you go home, don't even go to the bathroom. First, do that. Call your phone company. Do it. If you don't have it done already, do it. And they'll passcode it too. Excuse me. And they'll passcode it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. You gotta say you passcode. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Okay. Another thing I want to point out. This, I'm going to just rush through this really quick. Also, seniors, how many of you live in, actually live in within Sacramento, like the city, city? Okay. So most of the time, people think this only applies to folks, folks in rural areas as well. But as, a, as you saw with September 11th, when you see even in an urban environment, during um, an emergency, any type of natural disaster or man-made disaster, it doesn't matter, there's a lot of stuff that's going on on the ground. Uh, you have emergency personnel. You might have evacuation notices. You, 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 there's a lot of things that can go on in any given situation. And so part of that is communication of, of people trying to communicate, once again, communication, to see where should you be, where should you not be, what should you do, what should you not be doing. Sometimes even those emergency personnel have to communicate. So I have information about will my phone work in a power outage? Very important. And also using your phone during emergencies. And the reason I like to hand these out is because now, especially, a lot of folks, is anyone here on UVerse or any of the Comcast, the, the uh, telephone? I think a lot of people don't realize it's not a standard old copper landline style system. In essence, you're, what you're operating is VoIP, vo voice over IP. It's an internet based, it's a, it's a uh, broadband based technology where you're, you're, you're taking voice, converting it to beta. And so the thing is, you got to realize what those are using is it's not you can't just plug a dumb phone into it without a plug and all of a sudden you'll be able to talk to someone. These things require power. So there are certain requirements that some of these companies are required to have battery backup, but your battery backup will only last a couple hours. So it's very important to know what the limitations of your system are to make sure that information can be given to you in case of emergency, but also that you can also communicate if you have an emergency. Um, one last thing with uh, telephone. How many people here still use prepaid phone cards? Okay. Prepaid phone cards, it's one of those things, either it could be a wonderful thing or it could be completely illegitimate. I have, there's, there's different ways about what to look for when buying cards because some of them, they're not necessarily scams, but obviously there's so many charges and surcharges and whatnot that it really isn't worth your money in the end. So I always like to, to point that out to people. Now we're getting back into information about for hire passenger carriers, 
and moving companies. So for hire passenger carriers or limousines, charter buses, if anyone uh, through a senior group, church group, um, a club, but not if you if you hire someone to drive you somewhere, they are a for hire passenger carrier and must be licensed with us, the CPUC. I don't know if any of you've heard about that horrible, horrible crash uh, that actually took place about an hour north of here up on uh, Lone Star Road. They were going to Clusi Meeting Casino, and everyone was gone. And that was a bad operator, someone who was not licensed. And it's one of those things. You can call us, the same as Contractor Star License Board, you can call us and ask to see if someone's a bad operator, if they, they have any problems. You can go online, you can check. Protect yourselves. If you know someone's going on a trip, even if you're not going on a trip, just be a kind neighbor and, and check up on the group that they hired, just to make sure. Because you don't want to get a notice that, hey, you know, my best friend died because I didn't check to see who was driving them somewhere. So that's that's on the for hire passenger car. People, another thing people don't realize, that's also limousines. If you know anyone, like, uh, nieces, nephews, grandchildren, if they get limos for prom or whatnot, if they're going to go wine tasting up in the hills, same thing. Four hire passenger carrier. Check them out. Um, moving, moving companies are regulated as well. One thing is that we only regulate moving companies within the state of California. So if you're crossing straight state lines, all of a sudden, we really can't touch that. It, it changes. But if it's within California, we do regulate them. The most common complaint that I've heard in the past, what would happen is I am going to be moving Jane's household goods. And I say, hey, Jane, I've got your stuff. But actually, the move cost a little bit more than I thought originally. Yeah. So now, if you don't pay me $1,000 extra, I'm going to auction off all your belongings. Illegal. They can't do that. If it was not in a contract, if it was not there, if it was not, and once again, the C word, contracts. Make a contract. Make sure it's very specific. Doesn't matter if you're painting a room or having things removed or your, your household goods moved. Contracts. If it's not written down, if you just did a, like a handshake contract, there's not much for us to go on. Make sure it's well documented, well written, legitimate, everything's out there and then we can help make sure that people do not abuse you. Oh, yeah, every, everything, even if, and, and actually, yes, all the lines, and also, even if it's a blank, don't leave blank lines, just say N-A, or cross it out, and then write your, your put your initials and the date, just so people know that, yeah, this is space that was not supposed to be filled. That's the other thing to think about, too. Um, another thing, how many of you, this might be, this might also warrant no bathroom break when you get home, how many of you are on the do not call list? Both of you. Okay. I didn't see everybody's hand up, and that's why I'm like, no. The do not call list, it, it is, even working. though, excuse me? It's not working. Well, this is the funny thing. I'll get into that. The do not call list, we do not regulate this. This is actually federal. This is FTC. Um, I say FCC, excuse me, FTC. But what this is is that, once you put a number, either cell phone or landline, on the list, you're not supposed to receive unsolicited sales calls. And by unsolicited sales calls, I mean if someone calls up and says, hey, do you need a new vacuum cleaner? That's, that's what we're talking about for unsolicited sales calls. But now here's, the, here's kind of the tricky part, though. There's kind of a, a six degrees of separation issue here that let's say I um, am the bank that holds the mortgage on your home. And Jane is a subcontractor of mine. She can call you at your number because you do business with me and she is underneath me. So if you are a member of any clubs, groups, associations, past businesses, if you have, if you go to, to Costco or Sam's Club and they call you and they have a subcontractor that goes in through them, they can call you too. So some of those things, it, it, it might seem like you're being targeted by someone trying to just try to sell something to you, but unfortunately, sometimes it is the fact that these are secondary or tertiary components of a company that you're already dealing with, or a group that you've dealt with in the past, maybe it's a charity. I still get a lot of charity calls. I'll get a lot of calls from um, like firefighters associations when I ask them for money. Nonprofits are also exempt, but strict out of the blue sales calls from someone you've never dealt with before, you're not supposed to deal with that. So I, I can't guarantee that your phone will be completely free of any type of unwanted call, 
but at least strict sales calls, you're not supposed to do that. And if you do get those, and you can get numbers and names, you can actually report them on the FCC site. Now that it's getting into the political season, and the senator already left, I wanted to ask him how his, his office deals with this. Robocalls! We all know robocalls. Okay. So now, robocalls, also known as ADADs, it's automatic dialing assistant. So what the big, the big thing to know about robocalls is, for the most part, legally, a robocall is supposed to be introduced by a live person. So you'll get someone calling, hello, I'm calling from the senator's office, you know, we're going to play this short message, click, and then all of a sudden you get the robocall. Um, I recently was victim of a, of a type of robocalling, and it was very interesting that because I have a VoIP service, not a standard landline service, and then the person was calling from uh, a distribution network here in California, but because they weren't part of one of the large national networks like AT&T or Sprint or you know, the old Ma Bell or whatnot, since they were their own little funny thing, my agency, we couldn't touch them. And so there's these there's little ways, unfortunately, for folks to try and get by. So normally they, they would have been shut out of business if they they'd operated normally above above the board. So once again, if someone had got this message, it was someone trying to sell, um, saying, "Hey, you need to have your HVAC system looked at and tuned at. Call us." Um, if I didn't know that this was illegitimate. Some people might have called that. So unfortunately, it's one of those circumstances where it's education is the only way you can protect yourself. So think about that. So robocalls, there's legal ones, there's illegal ones. I'm not going to go through the whole thing here. A dozen ways to become more energy efficient. Saves resources, saves you money, also saves you wear and tear on things. If you have equipment in your house that you don't need to use as much or operates more efficiently, you'll probably not have to replace it as much or have to fix it as much too. So it's kind of a win-win situation. And once again, I would like to end with this, because I don't like to end on a negative note. Contacting the Public Utilities Commission. If you actually have a complaint or an issue, how to contact us. Um, something actually that happened recently, uh, one of the uh, city, someone in the city council's office here in Sacramento called me to see if they can get a hold of someone in San Francisco because there's a pg e gas field that had been abandoned and it was in a very poor neighborhood and to the point that uh, people were stealing metal. And so they were stripping out street lights and stealing manhole covers and folks were worried that they're gonna go in into this lot and steal everything and maybe it'll leak gas, cause an explosion, who knows. And the worst part was SAC PD, the Sacramento Police Department, they didn't even know who to call. They, they're like, who do we call to get this done? They're trying to call people and they weren't getting responses and so it's one of those things especially in, a, in a, like a, a life or limb situation, call us, call everyone, make, make us work, do it. Yeah, so, yes, I mean, any, anything with the metal in it. And so to me, so here, here, this is my whole wad of paper. So I, I would like people to go back and, and see what you need. But once again, I really want to reiterate, talk to people because folks like you who come here to these events, I don't mean to sound callous, but I kind of don't care about you in the sense that you're, you're, you're here to educate yourself. You're already on the ball. I, I don't need to worry about you as much as someone who never comes to things like this, who never leaves our house, who doesn't have friends. So what I'd like you to do is, if anything, even if this information doesn't apply to you, take some, give it to people you know who can use it or should use it. Because you're, you're already here. You're taking that first step of education. You're already building the shield. You're building the wall. And that's what we want to see. But definitely make sure you can help others too. All right, thank you. Thank you, Drew. Well, I want to thank you so much for your patience. We, we, it's not 3 o'clock yet, and we still have um, Jenny Works. Detective Jenny Works is here from SAC PD. And what's wonderful about having the police department here is that they know what's going on in the area, and they can tell you um, what the, the local scams are. So thank you for being here. Come on up. Thank you. Hello. Like she said, my name is Jenny Wirtz and I'm a detective with the Sacramento Police Department. I've been with the police department since 1998 and have been working in the financial crimes um, investigating since about 2007. So I wanted to um, talk not just about what's help, uh, what we see happening 
with our seniors in the community, but just identity theft overall. But I did want to um, specifically touch on some scams that we see going on that we see um, our seniors are becoming victims to. And like Senator uh, Steinberg said, our senior population is growing and growing, so it just seems like we're seeing more and more of this every year. Um, so some of the common scams that I want to talk about, and first and foremost, I want to say, if you ever, if you yourself or somebody you know becomes a victim to one of these scams, most importantly is to report it to somebody, whether it be APS or a relative or the police department, just make sure you tell somebody, because oftentimes we see that these aren't being reported because the seniors um, that, be, that have become victim to this are embarrassed to tell their family. They're embarrassed to report it to somebody. They think that if they tell their family, suddenly they're gonna, you know, their family's gonna take away their ability to control their own finances or whatever it may be, so they don't wanna say anything. And it's nothing to be embarrassed about. I've been out to these homes um, when seniors have called the police, and I have actually been there and answered the telephone when some of these people have called to scam these seniors, and they are very convincing. Um, so it's, it's nothing to be embarrassed about or to think, you know, oh, I would, this was so stupid for me to, you know, think this was true. They're very convincing, and so it, it's very important that you report this because it's not, um, it's not your fault and they are convincing. And some of the ones we've seen, and I'm just going to touch on a few, um, and you've probably heard of a lot of these, and kind of like what um, Drew just, um, just said is that pass this information on to your family and friends. I mean, you guys obviously know a lot of people and everyone should become aware of this, so pass this information on. Um, but some of the, the common scams we've seen um, that we kind of do our own names to them sometimes, but one, one of them that we call them the grandson scam, and that is they, they call um, and they say, you know, hi grandma, hi grandpa, this is so, this is, you know, Bill and I'm in jail and I need you to wire me some money. And it happens often and with the internet and all the information that's out there that we can find out about people, they can find out names of your relatives. They know that your grandson's name is Bill. And so it doesn't seem weird when they call you and say, hi, Grandma, this is Jane, and I need some money. I'm in jail. And they, you need to wire money to this location, and then the grandparent does it, and you know the grandson or granddaughter was never in jail, and they have felt... In Mexico. In Mexico, Mexico. yeah. Or Canada, usually not someplace you know in this country that we can track it back to. So that's one scam to kind of be aware of. Obviously, there's the lottery scams, um, which were, I've I've uh, been out to cases like that at the homes um, when they have called and said, "You've won the lottery. We just need you to send so much money in advance for the taxes, and then we'll mail you your check." And I know that you 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 know you see people cringe or kind of laugh, like, "Well, who would do that?" It happens all the time. And people think, okay, I'll mail my, you know, fifteen hundred dollars, and then for the taxes, and then I'm going to get my seven thousand dollar check in the mail. Or I've been there personally and spoke to them on the phone when they have said, "We are delivering your check right now. You know, we are coming down in a van. We're at San Francisco Airport. I mean, this is honest to goodness. This I was. I, I listened to this whole conversation. I spoke to the man. We're in San Francisco. We got delayed on the plane. We're on our way. We'll be there in two hours. Um, just make sure you go down to the local market and um, FedEx the money. I mean, um, money, um, Graham the money. We're on our way, but you need to go, you know, do that uh, wire transfer first, but we're on our way. We're on our way. Then they'll call in two hours. Oh, we got delayed, but we're still on our way. And this goes on for hours. And these people think that their money's really coming. Um, one thing, you know, like Drew said, I think also he stole everything I was going to say. No, um, I'm going before Drew next time. Um, <laughs> um, is that if it's too good to be, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Nobody is going to give you free money. Nobody, if you did win a lottery, first of all, did you sign up for the lottery? Did you fill something out to be part of this lottery? Probably not. So why in the world would you now be a winner of some lottery out of England? If you didn't sign up for that, somebody in your family did. yes, of course, somebody in your family wanted you to win the money. They didn't want to personally win it; they wanted you to win it. So <laughs> now you have won this money, and now you owe you have to pay them in advance in order to get this money. So if it sounds too good to be true, it is too good to be true. Nothing comes for free, and we all need to be aware of that. Um, another thing too um, that we actually see quite a bit of is. Um, and this does often happen to elderly people, is being stopped in the parking lots of um, banks or sh just in shopping centers, and they're approached by somebody, um, 
uh, and told that they need some help with some money. They have a large sum of money. They actually show them the money, a bag of money, and say, I need to deposit this money into a bank and get it um, you know, sent over back to Nigeria, sent to you know, my, my grandfather's back there, and he's trying to you know, do all these grand things, and we need, to, we need someplace safe for this money to go. And so they get, then they ask this person, you know, but I need to trust you, so can we go to your bank and take out some of your money so I can trust that you're not gonna run away and steal my money? They go together to this person's bank. This person will go in and take out $10,000, come out to the parking lot. They do these shenanigans and say they're blessing the money under a, you know, a, a prayer cloth, and they put it under there. Pretty soon, you, know, you look the other way, your money's gone. The money's gone. They give you the bag. The bag's empty. And um, none of that stuff is ob – obviously, it's all fraud, and they're all criminals. And so don't ever fall for that. Nobody – no, again – and they say, you know, and oftentimes this comes out of, and I mean, this might sound a little callous, but it comes out of people being greedy because they say, we'll give you some money. You do this for me and we'll give you $3,000. No, no one's going to ask you to deposit money into your bank or to wire transfer some, some money somewhere for them and they will give you $3,000 for doing that. <laughs> it does. Um, so it's, you know, once again, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Um, Door solicitors, that's something to be really careful about when people knock on the door. Um, we've seen that, you know, I haven't seen any of it lately or heard about it lately, but, you know, where two people will knock on the door and then they'll say, you know, hey, we're from PG&E. They'll have, you know, the hat on, the vest on, whatever they wear. We need to go in your backyard and check on some stuff. Um, can you take me back there? Are you home alone? They kind of question, are you the only one home right now? Yeah, I'm home alone. Will you take me in the backyard? I need to check on this, and it sounds all okay, and you go around the back with them, and in the meantime, someone go, enters the home and starts stealing things from the home. Um, so just be really careful. They, you know, if they want to go in your backyard or they need to do something, there's no reason why you need to show them back there, you know, if they were legitimate. They should all have IDs like they talked about before with, you know, there's some sort of ID they have. You can, they should have a number that you could call to verify that they should be at your residence. Don't, don't invite them in your house and don't let them talk you into coming out of your house and walking someplace with them because they're just doing that to get you out of your home so they can go in your home. Um, so just be real careful with all that stuff. Um, Sure. Yeah, I had someone coming uh, to my front door uh -huh. who said that he was washing windows mm -hmm. and gutter cleaners. Yeah. And, you know, I called the police or dial sure. 311. Sure. But see, I didn't have the energy to do it. You know, after a while, sure. I feel, but I suppose I probably should have to see if the person had, uh, I have a, luckily a security door, so right. I can see in. Right. I could see out. But, you know, I was thinking about it was during the day, and yeah. I know that a lot of my neighbors are not home. Sure. There's a lot of different things that those people are up to. I mean, some of them um, don't really want to wash your windows. Um, they're, some of them are going door to door to see what houses that no one's home. You came to the door, so they went on to the next house. And I'm not saying this is what they were up to. Yeah. Some of them may really want to wash your windows for money because they need it. Some might be trying to get you to invite them in your home or whatever. Some of them, um, you know, when it just comes to just a straight home burglary, they're knocking on the door. If you answer, they have something they're going to say like, oh, I was looking for Mary. Do, is she here? Do I have the right house? Or, oh, I was going to wash your windows. Do you, you know, if you didn't answer, then they're like, oh, no one's home. This might be a house that I can burglarize. So, so a couple different things, you know, might be going on there. It's always, you know, it's never a bad idea to call the police and just say, hey, there's a person, you know, describe them. They're kind of going door to door. I don't know what they're up to. The police, you know, as long as they're available, which, of course, our resources have been cut as well. But as long as someone's available, they'll come out to that area and they'll stop that individual and ask them, hey, what are you up to? What are you doing in this area? Do you have a license? Are you supposed to be doing this? So it's not, I mean, I would, I would advise you to call. Um, I usually do. Yeah. You know. I know. You get worn out. Sure. You know, having to call on everybody. Yeah. And, and I tell, I do neighborhood watch. And I tell everybody. That to call. They be, yeah. They should call because you don't know what that person's yeah. up to. Yeah. Um, and then some other things I kind of wanted to touch on is um, some things to avoid to, prob to hopefully help you um, not be a victim of identity theft. And some of those things, um, and we do find this a lot with more of our senior, um, senior citizens, is they still use checks a lot of the time. Checks are just bad. Um, there's so much information on a check that someone can um, use that you can then be a victim of identity theft, mainly your bank routing number that's on the bottom of your check. 
That number, that's all they need is that bank routing number to access your account, whether it be they can go online and purchase things and use that bank routing number, or what criminals often do is they create their own checks with their own name on it and their own address, and they use your bank routing number. It goes through, the money comes out of your account. And they will do this for a couple days. Um, they'll use your bank routing number for a couple days until your bank catches on to it or you happen to see it and see it's going out and put a stop to it. And then they just move on to somebody else and start using their um, bank routing number. So checks, if you can avoid using checks, it's probably the safest thing to do financially um, is to just kind of eliminate those. Or if you are gonna use them, um, you know, and you hand them directly to somebody, fine. Um, but don't ever put them in your mailbox. Um, we have a lot of mail theft that goes on, a lot of mail theft that goes on. And this not only happens at your home, and I know, I, mean, I live in an area where we have a cluster box. So, you know, you think it's safe and it's locked. No, it's not. They break into those cluster boxes. But if you do have to mail something, I mean, there's times when we have to mail checks. Um, just make sure you put it in, um, don't put it in your mailbox and let it sit overnight. Don't put it in the blue mailboxes at the post office or on the street where they have the blue mailboxes after the last pickup. If the last pickup was at 5 p.m. and you're driving by at 6 o'clock and you think, oh, I'll just throw this in there and they'll pick it up tomorrow, not a good idea. We have people, they make these little, um, take like a hanger with sticky on each side and they shove it down there and they just yank out mail. And they yank out tons of mail. They will sit there and just pull out all the mail and then they go through it all, open it up, and come out with all kinds of checks, personal information of yours, credit card stuff, um, and then they go home and they use that. All this stuff is available to these guys on the internet, guys and girls, I'm just saying guys in general, um, that they go home and they can, on the internet, they have their, um, their check-making material, their check-making you know, programs, all this stuff that they start using all your information and quickly start getting money out of your account. And the thing with checks and it coming out of your checking account is that's something that hits you quickly. Um, you know, and a lot of you might be on, you know, retired fixed incomes. That's something that it's going to, that money is going to come out of your account. Not to say you're not going to get reimbursed by your bank, but because chances are you are. You fill out, you know, an affidavit of fraud and say, this, you know, this wasn't me. These are um, fraudulent checks. They are going to reimburse you most likely, but it's still, it, it initially is going to come out of your account and you're going to have to deal with that. And especially if you're living month to month and that money starts coming out of your account, it's gone until the bank can resolve some things and get it back in there. But it's not something they're going to put back in there right away. So just be really, really careful when you're using checks. It's just, it's a, it's an easy way for people to get your information, your check information. Yeah. Uh, someone yesterday was speaking and said, don't carry your checkbook. No. Don't. Leave it at home. Yes. You know. I advise that too. She said, don't carry your checkbook, which is true. I don't carry a checkbook. I very rarely write checks. I mean, the safest way to do business is really, um, is really your, um, personally, I think, is your, like your Visa ATM card. Your Visa or your ATM card. Um, your ATM card, you need a PIN number. Obviously, I think we all know, don't, keep, don't have your PIN number anywhere in your wallet. Don't tell other people your PIN number. Don't make your PIN number something that's not... Um, not secure enough, like it's your birth date or it's your, you know, the first, you know, four letters of your name. Not a good idea. You want it to be something difficult that other people can't figure out, um, but never carry that PIN number with you. Never carry your social security card with you. I think we all probably know our social security card number by heart. We don't need to have that with us. And no one ever needs a hard copy of our social security number. If they do, you know that in advance going into it. If you're going to an appointment where you know you're going to need your hard copy of your social security card, then take it and then go put it back in that secure place that you keep it at your home. One other thing, if you have an ATM card, mm -hmm. uh, do not have Visa on, on it. Don't have those together. Always have just an ATM card. Because if you hand that to a restaurant or some other place, they can just take it back. Sure, they can use it as a Visa too. To yeah. Yeah, and I mean, the, the nice thing with if, if some fraudulent activity does happen like on your Visa card is that isn't, like I was saying, that's not an automatic hit to your bank account. You know, that if it's, you know, coming through the Visa, it's usually a point of sale um, transaction. It takes some time um, and they're really good at reimbursing your money. I mean, really, the credit card companies are great. You fill out an affidavit of fraud, you let them know I'm not responsible for these charges. They are great about reimbursing you. I mean, they know this is going on everywhere so they're really good about that so try and stick with using credit cards it's just easier to fix and it's not just a direct hit on your you know checking account at the time I yeah was at a financial uh, fair <clears throat> and then the lady said to use the visa rather than mm -hmm. the atm 
Because with the visa, if it's stolen or whatever, you're liable. I think it was fifty dollars. Where the ATM, you're liable for everything. There hmm. isn't a minimum. I'm not sure about that, so, but if that's true, yeah, yeah so then that's a good point. You should look into that. Sure. Yeah, you should look into that. And another thing on that same kind of um, line is that you really, to help, you know, prevent yourself, you know, just protection, oh, protection, is make sure you're looking into your, your bank account statements, your credit card statements, that you're requesting your free um, credit reports every year, annually. You're entitled to a free credit report. Request that. Look into that so you can file a dispute if there's something on there that shouldn't be. And with your bank accounts, your bank statements, most banks, um, they only allow, I, I think it's up to 90 days. And ba some banks could be different, so I'm not saying everyone's bank's the same. But that I know my bank personally, after 90 days, if I haven't reported something as being fraudulent, it's on me. It's mine now. I can't go back and say, oh, six months ago there was this transaction. They're like, well, you know, you should be better at looking at your accounts. And if you didn't notice it 90 days after, it, you know, within the 90 days after it occurred, sorry, we can't help you. So it's really important that you look over that stuff monthly. Um, I'm going to be kind of quick here because we're running out of time. Um, so things, um, like I said before, um, another thing I kind of want to touch on, and it's a little bit more of a sensitive um, subject, is as you, you know, age and you become elderly, is your care providers. We see so much fraud when it comes to care providers. And unfortunately, most of that fraud occurs when the care provider, some of the care providers are their own family members. Mm -hmm. So that's just something else, I and mean, we deal with that a lot. I mean, a lot of what I deal with is elder, abuse, elder financial abuse. And um, it happens oftentimes with grandchildren or children or nieces or nephews. And it's something you really, again, you need to make sure that you're communicating with your family and that you're not just leaving this um, responsibility up to one individual in your home, another individual that's helping you. Make sure other people are aware of what's going on and what should be happening with your money. And this, you know, make sure that you set some things in place while you still have capacity and have every have all you know the faculties and that you can make these financial decisions set some things in place that you so they know exactly what needs to have once you do lose capacity or once you can't handle your finances anymore because there is going to become a time when all of us cannot handle our finances and pay all our bills and do everything that we're supposed to do not you <laughs> so that's that's going to happen and you need to have things set in place while you still know what's going on and make sure that other people are aware of that and make sure that you stay in the loop and that you, um, you, know, you continue to check those, um, those statements and see what's going on and don't let people, um, don't let people take advantage of you. you know, if you have a care provider that comes in your home and they start asking you, can I borrow money? I'm running a little short this month. Can I borrow some money for, you know, I don't have money to pay my rent. That's not okay. And especially if they come from an agency, if they're, an in, if they're providing in-home support service from an agency, they are not allowed to ask you for money. They are not allowed to ask you for gifts. That kind of thing is not supposed to happen. They're paid through their agency and you are paying that agency. So extra money is not allowed. Um, so that you just need to really be aware of that stuff and report it, let somebody else know and just make sure that your family or friends or somebody else is involved and knows what's going on just to help you know you not be a victim of um, of fraud when it comes to care providers yeah well sometimes you can find out interesting things my niece is taking care of my brother who's a quad uh -huh. veteran from the war and he discovered she was on drugs and yeah. certain things started uh, disappearing sure being asked yeah so that was a big thing on yeah the and he's just lucky that you guys were aware of it and that you guys, you know, knew what was going on. Otherwise, you know, there's so often that family's not involved and so they don't see these things happen. And then suddenly, you know, $70,000 is gone and they're living on, you know, they have $400 left in their account. You know, and that's just awful. I mean, these people have worked their whole lives. It's their retirement. And now it's gone because someone took advantage of them. You know, and some things to look out for, and this will be my last point, some things to look out for, um, you know, that you've possibly become a victim of identity theft, or if you start getting, um, if bills aren't arriving, um, expected bills aren't arriving, and that's possible that someone's changed some addresses and are having things go to a different location. Um, if you're getting unexpected credit card statements, things that you didn't have before, now suddenly you're receiving these. Um, if you're receiving denials for credit, um, for no reason, you haven't applied for credit, you're not trying to get a new car, and you're receiving these denials, someone's probably using your social security number, you know, your name, date of birth, and applying for credit in your name. So those are all red flags. And if you see those, you certainly should um, do something about putting a, um, a uh, 
a fraud alert on your social security number and you can do all that through um, I don't know if everybody uses computers and is um, savvy on the websites but those are great the Federal Trade Commission has a great website that um, will walk you all through identity theft what to do if you've been a victim how to put fraud alerts on your accounts and you can put the, those fraud alerts are free and you can put them on there and no one can access your credit or apply for credit without you being contacted so um, those are all great things to do. So um, if you don't have access to a computer or are not comfortable working on the computer, find a family member or a friend that is and look at those things because those are great websites and things that everyone should be aware of. Um, I put some things back on the um, table with um, Detective Morse. And um, it's just a little pamphlet on um, avoiding identity theft as well as a little sheet, a uh, little quiz on are you at risk for identity theft. It has some questions with some points about um, are you at risk for being a victim of identity theft. So take a few of them, like we said, share them with your family and friends and pass the word on on how to not become a victim of identity theft. And if you have um, any questions, I'll stick around. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's scary. I know. It is scary. You're right. Yeah, we need to spread the word. Okay. Thanks for having me. What's the recovery rate on some of these things? You were talking about for credit cards and uh, for credit cards, it's, it's very good. But for other people who get scams, what's the recovery rate? It's not good. Um, if you, I mean, I have to be honest, if you've become victim of um, a scam like, like what we call the Nigerian scam or the grandson calling in scam, and you t do a money order and you mail it off to some usually out of this country, it's very, we are not going to get your money back. And we're not going to be able to track where that went. It's left the country and it's very, very difficult to figure out anything. Money orders are like cash. I mean, once it's gone, it's gone. And so it's very difficult. So that's why we warn people over and over not to mail, you know, those money grams off, not to not to do that because we aren't we aren't going to find out who did that, and you probably aren't going to get your money back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Detective Work. I again want to thank you for coming. We are out of time, so we will be out back at the tables to answer any questions. And I do want to say that. For the contractors, um, our board members, Matt and Joanne, did a great job, Joan did a great job of talking about a lot of the subjects, but there, we do have a brochure called What Seniors Should Know Before Hiring a Contractor, so please grab that. So thank you very much.